can grow acceptable quality wheat outdoors, for that, outdoors sure. and sell it for a dollar an ounce. Mm -hmm. hey. There would still be a market for We're the on. We're on. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to another edition of Drugs, Crime, and Politics. Uh, I'm your host, Buford Terrell, and you may have noticed we were hot into a discussion before uh, I found out we were on the air. Uh, we're brought to you by the Drug Policy Forum of Texas. Uh, with me, as usual, is my colleague, Clayton Jones. Good evening tonight. And Clayton, would you care to introduce our guest tonight? This is a gentleman uh, from the, what, 19th Congressional? 29th Texas 29th Congressional District. Texas Con uh, Congressional District uh, is running against Gene Green. And I, <laughs> your name again? Brandon Compton. Brandon Compton. And that will be for next year's election. Yes. Um, the actual elections will be in November 2012. Okay. Uh, are you affiliated with a party, or do you have to go through a primary of any kind? Or? No, I'm, I've got interest in a couple parties I'm looking at, but for the mainstream, so far, I'm looking at running as an independent. Okay. So you're, you're focusing already on the general election. Yes, sir. Uh, in particular, what what are some of your goals? Well, for the starting, I would really like to see a shift in foreign policy. I've been, you watching down like in Latin America, you've seen a lot of countries pulling out of stuff we had set up in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Like, I mean, you see all this demonization of Hugo Chavez, yeah. a man who's pushing for a lot of rights for his people, changing the economy, not allowing for, you know, American industries to privatize their resources. Yeah. Second of all, another issue I would like to see is actually the you know legalization of marijuana on a, on a medical marrow side, medical side, sorry, and actually for the personal use as well. You know, if you got the right to drink a beer in a bar anywhere else, you should at least have the right to grow it in your house. Okay. Uh, I want to go back and look at a couple of things that have been happening in the news this week. Uh, we have a a very important historical thing that is happening in Sugarland, They announced today that the state will be closing the central prison unit located right in the middle of Sugarland. It has been in operation for 102 years and they're planning to close it down next month. Uh, some of you may be familiar with the most famous inmate of that prison in the 1930s. A man named Huddy Ledbetter wrote several songs while he was there in prison. One of them I think all of us have heard and some of us even taught it to his, our kids called the Moonlight Special. Huddy was better known by his stage name, nickname, of Lead Belly, and his songs were so good that they persuaded the governor to commute his sentence and let him out. So there was a man whose guitar led him to freedom. But the Midnight Special Prison is about to become another Sugarland subdivision. So it, there's 67 <laughs> acres they're going to sell with it. Yeah, and that's that's a substantial uh, chunk of change that will be coming into the state from that. Uh, I don't know if it's a coincidence or if there's some trend involved, but a couple of weeks ago, uh, the little town of Leveland, about 30 miles northwest of Lubbock, uh, announced they were auctioning off an almost brand new barely used jail. They built it five or six years ago, planning to lease it out to a private corporation to operate. The leasing deal fell through. Leveland is now out of money. They're planning to get at least $5 million. So if you want an almost unused jail, Go online and Leveland will be happy to to, wow. to sell I've been you. On it. <laughs> now, whether this is a trend across the state or not, I don't know. 
but uh, I would think the closing of two prisons is at least a welcome sign in some ways. So. Well, here we are in Houston. We're sending prisoners to Louisiana to pay for jails. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't we be better off keeping them right here in our own state, keeping the money right well, going around? Actually, my suspicion, having lived in Louisiana for several years, is that Louisiana probably rents jail space to us and turns a profit on it at a lower price than we could do it ourselves. I mean, if you ever want to see a place that doesn't believe on spending any money on what the government does other than the money that goes into the politicians' pockets. Uh, Louisiana's the place to go. Uh, the best streets there would probably be condemned in the state, and that's not saying much. And it kind of concerns me, a lot of those prisons out there being, like you mentioned, the one that they were trying to auction off yeah. is being run by a private company. Yeah. I mean, it kind of sickens you that a company can make money off someone going to jail, being incarcerated. Well, well the way that all started is the uh, private prison industries have gone to these different towns and said, listen, you build the prison, we'll fill it up for you. And there's three, or, two or three towns in Texas that are going broke because of that reason. And one of the results is that the private prison industry has become a major lobbyist. Oh yes, in, on both the state and federal. Ca level. California is a prime example of that. I mean, yeah. how many of their prison guard unions influenced for harder sentences in the last 15 yeah. years? It's yeah, but uh, mo many states I've noticed over the past couple of years have had to take very hard look at their prison budgets. Now, one of, one of the problems, of course is that if we look at the federal system, over half of the federal prisoners are there on drug charges. Most of the states, which handle more day-to-day -day crime, uh, it usually runs more like 20% or so, but that's still a lot of people locked up for in effect, what are simple commercial transactions? And a lot of those, you're talking about the drug charges, a lot of them revolve back around to marijuana. <laughs> well, yeah. A chunk, yeah. good percentage of them. Yeah. You gotta realize, we have a ton of people for nothing more than marijuana in our state prison system. We don't call it marijuana. We call it uh, testing dirty on a UA. It yeah. doesn't matter what the drug is, you're still gonna go back and we've yeah. got some... Yeah. And you're taking 18-year-old, 19-year-old kids who are just walking down the street, maybe, you know, sure, they're out a little late or something like that, doing something like this, but you're giving them a federal crime against them. That's going to haunt them for the rest of their life for having a joint on them. Maybe yeah, they'll they're, they're not going to go ridiculous. federal on, yeah. on something like that. They, they can do some heavy but charges they'll, they'll pretty sure. They'll still get a state misdemeanor rap, yeah. which it still in follows effect, you. it says they can't get a job they can't rent an apartment. They have trouble going to school. Uh, the, the legal consequences are a whole lot worse than the direct consequences of the drug use. That was, that was what Jimmy Carter said when he tried to do some reforms, when he said the drug laws should do no worse harm to the person than the drugs would Itself. do to him. Yeah. So. Well, we were talking a little bit locally. There's been a couple of good things, good things, I wouldn't say. There are a couple of things that happened here in locally. One was in Galveston, yeah. and one was last week right here in Houston. Yeah. Uh, Galveston, they found a big bale of cocaine. Hmm. I don't know exactly how much was in it, but it was supposed to be a bunch. And then here in Houston, we had a 20-year, 19-year a uh, police sergeant that was fired. <laughs> okay. Um, 
He was running a security for delivering of cocaine. Yeah. Well, now, if you go back, and I, I was just checking this, uh, President Herbert Hoover, and this would have been in about 1929 or 30, appointed a commission to look into the law enforcement problems with prohibition mainly. And this commission under Mr. Wickersham, it's known as the Wickersham Commission Report, came back and pointed out that in 10 years, over 1,400 federal prohibition agents had been either fired, forced to resign because of corruption, or been convicted. And that was roughly a third of all of the agents that had been hired. And that's something that happens any time you have prohibition laws. It leads to large-scale corruption of law enforcement. Uh, in the heyday of the cocaine boom in the 1970s, when Florida was simply awash with cocaine and cocaine dealers. The Department of Justice uh, instituted a practice of taking U.S. attorneys from other parts of the country, say Montana, flying them down on temporary duty to Miami to prosecute a few drug cases and then sending them back home so that they didn't live with the system long enough to become Correct. hooked up with and, and a party to the drug dealing. Yeah. So. With the police level, I mean, you got guys making anywhere from 28, 30,000 a year. They're seeing all this money flowing through the streets. You guys start getting a little behind on their mortgage course. And it, it, it opens up too much eyes to them. And they, a lot of these officers also see these drugs laws as you know, the only way to say it politely on TV is shenanigans. Well, they know people are going to yeah. do it and get it regardless. Let's take this 20-year-old officer Clayton's talking about. Uh, one thing that they find with a lot of more senior officers like that is they sit there and they look back and they see what they've been doing with the drug laws in their own lives for the 20 years or so. They haven't made any difference. The drugs are still there. The prices are still the people same. People are still using them. Same number of users. So and people finally will, they get they to find the point new drugs to they, make. I mean, you saw yeah. meth slowly started rising in the '80s, becoming really popular. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, crystal meth blew really blew up. I mean, no, you had a no, shift from didn't. heroin to crystal meth no, to crack. No, it didn't. In the 1960s, the amphetamine type stimulants which includes dextroamphetamine or dextrodrine, methamphetamine, and Ritalin, which is all three of them, your body can't tell them apart, basically. These were the most highly prescribed legal drugs in the country. And they had developed quite a few problems because of overuse of them. These became controlled substances in 1970. In 2005-2006, Professor Rasmussen studied it as best he could. And at that time, as near as he could figure out, looking at those three interchangeable drugs and combining legal and illegal use both, there was, on a per capita basis, about the same use of the amphetamine family in 2005 or 6 as there was in 1970. The overall use had not changed measurably. And right now, you can still get prescription methamphetamine. It's usually prescribed for children with attention disorders under the name desoxin, but it's still a legal drug. Now, what has happened in the meantime is we've had a hell of a lot of hype coming at us about amphetamines. And because 
we're not allowing legal regulated pharmaceutical companies that are subject to quality and environmental controls to manufacture and sell methamphetamine through the pharmacies. We instead have a bunch of high school dropouts using cookbook chemistry they learned off the internet, making it in their kitchen and blowing themselves and the neighborhood up when they do it. That's the difference, is that we now have homemade labs blowing each other up because they're not under any kind of governmental control. We have street corner gangs selling it oh, yeah. where they can't go to court and sue each other, so they use guns to fight it out instead. Let's take a break, and we'll be back in a minute or two. <laughs> fighting over drugs, they're fighting over money. Drug laws have no basis in science. Drug laws are based on politics and money. So there's this unholy symbiosis between, on the one hand, those who are selling illegal drugs, the uh, drug lords, if you will, and on the other side, the drug warriors. The war on drugs uh, isn't working, and uh, if anything, it's just making what we call the drug problem a lot worse. To We're I back uh, with drugs, crime, and politics. Uh, I think that this would be a good time to slip in my book review of the week. Uh, the book I want to mention tonight is one that I finished reading about two weeks ago, and I think I've got a contact high still <laughs> just from handling it. I'm talking about Steve Tyler's memoir, Does the Noise in My Head Bother You? I'm sure most of you know that Steve is the lead singer of uh, the Aerosmith Band, has had his own drug problems, been in and out of rehab about uh, four times. This is a good look at the life in the entertainment business and heavy duty, high level drug use. So, I believe we've got a caller. Hello, caller, you're on the air. Yes, I'd like to ask a question. Okay. I know the doctors and the scientists, they always do experiments with the lab mice. And I was just wondering what kind of studies have the lab mice shown uh, when they studied marijuana tests on them? Okay, that's a good question. Uh, the lab mice have thrived on marijuana, but 
the real secret here is we don't have to look at tests on mice because we have very good, well-controlled medical scientific tests on human beings. There are now literally tens of thousands of published medical research papers on giving marijuana to human beings. Yeah, that father who gave his two-year-old cannabis oil out of treatment instead of uh, the chemo. And yeah. Now, what these have shown is that for any number of diseases and conditions, marijuana has a very positive medical mm. effect. They have also shown that there are no <coughs> actual harmful side effects to it. Uh, UCLA Medical School, which has probably the leading lung institution in the whole world, has found lower incidences of lung cancer among marijuana users than among the general population. One long-term study by the Kaiser Permanente Health Organization on the West Coast, tracking long-term health studies of their patients in the organization over periods of 20 to 30 years and looking at literally tens and thousands of patients showed that those that admitted to using marijuana were actually healthier on all of the metals, measures they used than the people who did not admit to using marijuana. Yeah, and you got a lot of patients that are currently taking chemo <coughs> that have no appetites. Yeah. They're losing weight, their immune systems are decreasing. Yeah. Then you see them start actually either just taking cannabis or not even just smoking marijuana. Yeah. Eating it, and, you know, cooking in brownies and such, you know, making the special brownies. <laughs> and as soon as they start ingesting it, <coughs> smoking it, using the cannabis oil, they get their, their appetites back. Yeah. Their immune system starts rebuilding. They start healing better, you know, accepting treatment a lot yeah. easier and having happier lives. Yeah. It's just ridiculous. This, it was like we were talking before the show. I really feel a lot of a push to keep it down is by a lot of the pharmaceutical companies because you allow people to grow in, in their house, you yeah. got a headache instead of spending six yeah. bottles of bottle of aspirin, you can smoke, you know, a little yeah. J and yeah. there goes that headache. Yeah. But no, I, I think it's more uh, your alcohol uh, companies. Budweiser does not want you to have a choice. Oh yeah, I agree with you on that, yes. <laughs> and you know, we've gone through this uh, prescription thing in California, yeah. Oregon, Washington, and there's, there is a, a decrease in the amount of sales of uh, prescriptions, but it's not so much that it's hurting the uh, manufacturers. No. And mo most, of the, most of the drugs that marijuana competes with are dirt cheap to begin with. Uh, the real conflict happens to be in pain medication. And I think one thing that people need to ask is, if you had someone in your family in severe pain, would you rather that they have a little marijuana or a little morphine? Because that's what marijuana usually replaces right. are the opium derivatives like morphine and Vicodin and Percocet and Oxycontin. See, and that's one thing that concerns me too, is you see a lot of those pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical pills that become highly addictive. I mean, anything could be addictive for anybody. Mm. But, I mean, when was the last time you heard of someone overdosing off of marijuana? <laughs> it can't happen. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they have, they, there's something that doctors and pharmacologists call the therapeutic ratio of a drug. And that's the ratio between the amount that it takes to be effective therapy to do what it's supposed to do for you and the amount that it takes to kill you. If we take morphine as an example, 
the therapeutic ratio is only about three to one that you can take about 50 or 60 milligrams to handle severe pain, but about half the people that take it die at about 150 to 160 milligrams. They estimate the pharmaceutical, or the therapeutic ratio for marijuana to be about 20,000. And they estimate it because they have never been able to cram enough marijuana into any kind of lab animal to kill it. There's never been a reported overdose death. Hello, caller, you're on the air. Yes, I have a comment. I'd just like to say that, you know, I think that there's a lot of unemployed people out there who are very intelligent and employable, but they don't get the job because maybe they have marijuana in their system. I'm thinking that that's not fair. I mean, you know, maybe you've been on your job and you don't pass a random test or something like that, but you're highly intelligent and, and you get scrutinized because maybe something's in your system, you know? Yeah, and there's a question of what does the fact that you have used marijuana a couple of weeks ago have to do with your ability to do the job? Oh, yeah. You got people out there who get and done... They, and they can't tell if you're using it. They don't do it randomly because yeah. your behavior is still normal. You know? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, and like I was saying, I mean, you got people who may have just done heroin or cocaine a few days ago. That's not going to show up on a test, but if they did marijuana mm. two, three weeks ago, it well, can still uh, show up unless they totally flush their system the, out. The one drug that critically affects on-the-job performance and on-the-job job safety is alcohol. Alcohol is totally disappears from the system within six to eight hours. So you can go out and get horribly, horribly drunk until midnight or one o'clock, show up at work the next morning with a horrible hangover so that you can barely function, and you'll pass a drug test measuring alcohol. Marijuana's out of the system within about 48 hours, but it leaves some residue that's not intoxicating in any way, but which can show up and flunk a test for up to about four weeks. But you, you mentioned something earlier that his call made me think of. He talked about all of the great numbers of unemployed people we have in this country. And you mentioned something about uh, industrial hemp. Let's Take this phone call and talk about industrial hemp. Okay. Through. Hello, caller. You're on the air. Hi. Hello. Hey, guys. I just want to thank you all for your show. Thank you. Uh, I want to quick, make a quick comment. I can't agree with you more about the drug. It has more purposes than just the pain and all that. I am a very aggressive person, and I found out through marijuana, uh, it helps me out a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, okay. Uh, I just wanted to add that to it. I know y'all, it does have its medicinal purposes, but for it, it serves many, many purposes. And I pre appreciate, really appreciate this show. Okay. Thank you guys for your time. Thank you a lot. Um, you know, we can appreciate people like this caller. Yeah. If they w would uh, take the next step, go see their state representative, sit down and write a letter to your state representative. Get involved. Are your congressman or would be congressman? Yes. 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 Get involved. Yeah. Uh, I did want to ask you a question, and this is, uh, you mentioned something about being in favor of industrial hemp. Yes. Uh, first, tell us a little bit about what industrial hemp is, and second, what would legalizing it do maybe to some job opportunities? It would do more than job opportunities. You just go back in your history books. This nation was pretty much started by hemp. Yeah. Ropes, clothes, paper, all created from hemp. Okay, everyone talks about we have a forestry problem. We're destroying all the trees. There's another solution right there. Start growing hemp. We need clothes. How many of our clothes come out from the foreign markets, from China, Thailand? You know, I mean, look at that. You can get a lot more job opportunities created by people wanting to start their own businesses here in America selling clothes. I mean, you have a lot of creative young minds out here in America starting up their own industries. That's a perfect way to go right there. And we're one of the only largest industrial nations that, don't, that can have an imported 
but we can actually grow it and create it ourselves here. That's right. And there's we're, a big difference between hemp and actual marijuana. We're, which, we're actually using hemp in industry that we import from Canada and China. Yes. And, <coughs> and there's a lot of products out there. I mean, I actually started using hemp conditioner. Okay. And I actually realized it works a lot better than the stuff I've been using with Suave and all that. Yeah. Well, there are a lot of cosmetics based on hemp as well as oh, There's hemp a lot of practical foods. uses yeah. for it. Hello, caller. You're on the air. Hey, Buford. It's Dean. How are you doing? Just fine. How are you, Dean? I'm good. I'm good. I'm, uh, I, I don't know. Uh, becoming a little more optimistic every week now. Uh, more and more people are speaking out, like the NAACP most recently. Uh, yes. That was a real game changer, yes. yes. In, indeed. And, uh, you know, that follows on the heels of the... Uh, What's the gathering called? The National Conference of Mayors with their unanimous endorsement yes. of, you know, ending our drug war tactics. And, uh, of course, the Global Commission on Drugs and more and more newspapers, including our own Houston Chronicle. Yes. Uh, it makes me wonder, what will it take to motivate the folks out there to, uh, you know, write that 50-word letter and send it off to their Congress critter? You know, I mean, that's <laughs> what it's going to take is the masses finally saying enough is enough. Getting involved. Okay. Thank you, Dean. Anything new from your side of the fence over there? Um, well, I, I think about the, uh, the the guests I've had in the last few weeks. We, we had uh, uh, some, I think, powerful guests last week on uh, the Drug Truth Network show, yeah. Cultural yeah. Baggage and Century of Lies. Um, let's see. We had uh, an, an author uh, this last time uh, to speak on the, the harms of, of you know, the, the drug war. Mike Hyde also was a, another guest recently whose son had brain cancer. This is a three-year-old kid who's yeah. uh, using medical marijuana up there in the state of Montana. Uh, yeah. And then uh, last week we had Megan Ralston. She's out of the Drug Policy Alliance. We were talking about Amy Winehouse and, you know, rehab and relapse yeah. and all that stuff. And I, I think more and more folks are beginning to realize the um, futility of going down this same road because... Uh, there are fewer and fewer people standing against what you and I are doing these days, right, Buford? Right, right. Uh, if people want to hear more, Dean, where can they find you? Okay, well, uh, if they listen to uh, KPFT, which is 90.1 FM here in Houston, uh, this coming Sunday at uh, 6.30 p.m., I'll be interviewing uh, Christian Parente. He's author of Tropic of Chaos. It's about climate change and the new geography of violence worldwide. And then on uh, the Century of Life show, I'll interview Neil Franklin. He's the director of uh, uh, law enforcement against prohibition. Okay. I, I urge folks to uh, tune in again at 90.1 FM Sunday. And your website? Uh, the website is drugtruth.net, and uh, you can access uh, hundreds of shows with congressmen, scientists, doctors, all kinds of folks uh, talking about this drug war. Okay. Cooper, thank you very much. Thank you, Dean. Have a good night, Dean. Hi, Joe. Uh, I've been thinking that uh, agriculture has always been a prime driver of the Texas economy. Uh, and if we go back to the year 1949, the author William Burroughs rented a 150-acre farm in New Caney and planted it all with marijuana to sell to his friends in New York. Uh, do you see a place for marijuana farms in Texas agriculture? Uh, I, would love, I, see, I would love to say I see it, but seeing how we, everyone knows Texas is a primary Republican state, yeah. I don't know if it could shift that way, but keep pushing for people we could because but, Texas farmers... They're just like any other businessman. They want something they can grow and will make profit off of. Maybe we just need to point out to the Texas farmers how much a good hemp crop would be worth. Oh, um, yeah, and it's a plant that can survive. I mean, yeah. it doesn't need ample amounts of water. It becomes a better product, of right. course, yeah. but it doesn't need to be like an actual in a rainforest environment all the time. You okay. can grow the thing right. in your closet. <laughs> right. Uh, it's time to take a break. We'll be back in a couple of minutes.
The jury right to say not guilty is an essential safeguard against injustice, which dates back to English common law and the founding of the United States. Jurors in early 19th century America routinely refused to enforce the Alien and Sedition Act, and they rejected the Fugitive Slave Act. Jurors in early 20th century America refused to enforce alcohol prohibition. The injustices of the war on drugs have become obvious to many Americans. In cases where the law, prosecutorial excesses, and the likely sentence seem manifestly unfair, jury nullification ensures the citizen juror a more equal status with those who write the laws. Please visit the Fully Informed Jury Association, FIJA.org. Please keep such decisions private. Nullification is your right, your responsibility, perfectly legal and just. About 60 plus percent of the marijuana use in this country is clearly in, you know, in Anglo communities, in white communities. But if you look at the rate of arrest, you end up realizing that 10 percent of the people end up accounting for 35 percent of the rest. If you look at the prosecution, then we end up, end up representing about 47 percent of those who get prosecuted. If you look at convictions, we end up being close to 60 percent of those who get convicted. If you look at those who end up being incarcerated, you end up being about 72 percent. So you go from being 10 percent of the population to being 72 percent of the people who are being incarcerated. I call it that there is a a criminal industrial complex that has learned how to mine black gold. Good evening. You're watching Drugs, Crime, and Politics on Houston Media Source. We're back with Drugs, Crime, and Politics. Uh, we've been talking a little bit about industrial hemp and I noticed one of the things that you didn't mention with industrial hemp is biofuel. Yes. Both hemp seed oil as biodiesel and the cellulose uh, enzyme route to ethanol through the fiber content. And Clay was talking about earlier how just making cotton would be a main competitor for, you know, hemp. Yeah. The bigger competitor would be Petro. I mean, you, we would have a big push against it from them. But yes, it'd be a lot more resourceful because, first of all, OPEC yeah. could bring us to our knees if they wanted to by in, in putting an embargo on us like they did in the 70s. Yeah. You start having a push of hemp, bio, bio, just like yeah. we're talking about now, I, I would love to see that especially. I mean, yeah. first of all, it's creating more American jobs, bringing more money back into the American economy. Yeah. And it's preventing stuff from happening like we did in the 70s again, where you have 30 cars in line for just one gas pump. It, yeah. it becomes a ordeal. And, and I think that uh, if we have any of these OPEC countries that are going to try to starve us out, we need to bring George Bush back and he can start another <laughs> war. <laughs> it, it's definitely true. I mean, and this is what we were talking about earlier. How much earlier. oil have we gotten from Iraq after that war? <laughs> That was supposed to be our direct pipeline yeah. into the oil fields. Yeah. All it was was set up a bunch of contracts. That's yeah. really what it was. And who was one of the main contractors? Who was vice president? Cheney, right? You that was the Mr. guy? Mr. And Halliburton? Did, yeah. And didn't, what company did he run again? <laughs> Halliburton. That's right. Yes. Yeah. It, it was a lot of bad contracts. I mean, and this, what's concerning me, too, is uh, I was reading the headlines today is um, they were talking to Iraq, saying to the prime minister, saying, we need to know if you want our, our, you know, our soldiers to stay. Yeah. And they're debating this. I'm like, OK, it's going to show you. And another thing is, even if they pull them out, you're still going to see an increase in defense contractors yeah. out there in Iraq. So even if we pull the actual soldiers out, we're just going to send out <coughs> Blackwater. Yeah. Well, you know, you're, you're planning to run for Congress. and. Uh, we're talking about the influence of companies. Uh, let me throw an idea out to you, one that I've been toying with. Uh, have you ever seen a NASCAR driver on race day with his coveralls and his cap? What, what does a NASCAR driver have all over his coveralls? Logo, logo, logos. What would you think about the requirement? that any time a member of Congress appears in public or on the floor of the House, he'd be required to wear a jacket 
with the logo of everyone who has given him Let me stop more right there, than say $2,500. It wouldn't work because they're gonna have, they can't wear this jacket. They're going to need a banner. <laughs> okay. <laughs> they're going to have to have a billboard following them everywhere. Do you think that that might improve the quality of government a little bit? I think it would show a lot more to it, yes. And <laughs> like I said, a jacket wouldn't work. They're going to need a <laughs> billboard well, behind them. What would help our politicians if people would just get to be one subject minded this is what i'm interested in i want you to stop the drug war and if you can't be uh do this for us we can't vote for you it's not just with drug war it's because we got to push you know, for not... iraq and afghanistan fully ending that i mean it's just a circle event where the politicians are leading the people to what they want to vote for and right now frankly i'm I think we need to worry more about jobs before we even get to the drug war. Yeah, this is true. And well, I think that there's. In other words, I can't see myself not, ever. Not just jobs, becoming but becoming a single issue voter. Well, not just I, that, but jobs yeah. and the dollar, the value of the dollar. Inflation is rising, and you have the whole scare with the debt ceiling and having America's credit rating downgraded, which is still a concern. Well, the problem is those are somewhat contradictory. If you look at our history, the reason why business is stagnant now and the reason why they haven't created jobs is because there are no customers out there. The money's available on the market, but Ford's not going to start producing a tenth more cars because who would buy them? We find even big chains contracting because they have no customers. What has worked in the past is the government has started paying a lot of salaries into non-competitive, non-productive jobs. The classic examples were the Civil War and the Second World War where we just wasted money by giving it to people to shoot each other and to buy uniforms and to buy guns that just make things blow up. We got no products out of that. But it made tons of jobs, made money, and got the economy going. We did it with building the railroads. We did it by building the big dams. We did it by building the interstate highway system. The problem is the main problem right now is to get the economy going, which means jobs, which probably means more short-term debt. The total indebtedness is a longer-term problem that if we get the people back to work, then we can adjust the tax rates and do other things. But those will help the economy, but getting back to inflation. I mean, that's, uh, killing, that's killing a lot of things in America. Not really. Inflation right now is still very low, one to two percent at most. That's much lower than the, the working in the industry I work in. It's a little bit higher than that. It's in the threes now, okay. and it could continue to rise, especially seeing how you're seeing more but even, quantitative easing coming out of the Fed. Even three to four percent is still lower than historically and is not. But how much is your saving interest rate right now in your savings account? You're looking at <laughs> everyone gets happy if they hear 1.5% yeah. on a five year CD. And if we got a little bit more inflation, that 1% would go up to one and a half or two. Inflation's a tool just like other tools. It's but it's a tool we, we can do without and it's being regulated by a monopoly, the Federal Reserve. I mean, that's something else I would like to yeah. push with yeah. to actually end. I mean, I'm really against, it's a group of yeah. bankers pretty much controlling what what this privatized yeah. bank can do and who they can give it to. I mean, you just yeah. had that makeshift audit happen and it yeah. proved a lot of people's suspicions that they were loaning out to foreign banks, some of which are supposed to be against America. Well, and you, yeah. it, but it's kind of concerning. Yeah. I know they are, but uh, these are they're making money off of us, yeah. the American taxpayer. Let's take a break, and then you've got, when we come back, you've got an announcement yes. to make. So we'll see you in a minute. <laughs> this is fun. <laughs>
with some brilliant entrepreneurs came up with the idea of blocking the endocannabinoids in our body to create a new diet drug. The theory being, if cannabis gives people the munchies, then blocking the endocannabinoids would make them lose their appetites. The drug they developed, Ramonabont, did indeed reduce appetite by blocking the endocannabinoid receptors. But data from clinical trials showed that Ramonabont users suffered depression, anxiety, insomnia, and aggressive impulses at twice the rate of subjects given a placebo. Well, Sanofi Aventis, the company that had, had developed and was marketing this agent, did not study people with a history of psychiatric illness or depression before they applied for approval. That was probably a mistake. The EMA did approve it, and the drug's been on the market in Europe for a year, a year and a half by now. And I've, I've sort of said, if there was any real problem with this that was more than just theoretical, we would know. Well, it turns out we do know. And they've, they've suggested now that the risk for this agent it outweighs the benefit. In one study, there were five suicides among Rabonabont users because, as they discovered, endocannabinoids are also mood regulators with the capacity to make us feel euphoric or, when blocked, depressed. Rabonabont was finally withdrawn from the market in 2008. Researchers at the MD Anderson Cancer Center in Texas reported that mice and Ramonabont developed potentially cancerous polyps at a far higher rate than controls, confirming that endocannabinoids are not only mood regulators, but tumor regulators as well. Hi, I'm Ethan Nadelman, the founder and executive director of the Drug Policy Alliance. You're watching Drugs, Crimes, and Politics. Hope you enjoy it. Welcome back to Drugs, Crime, and Politics. Uh, before we get tied up again, Clayton, I think you've got something to announce. Yes. This coming Friday, August the 5th, at 8 o'clock in the morning, we at Normal are starting a protest at our... Co uh, county courthouse at 1201 Franklin Street. We have a few, about 10, 12 people that are, we know are going to show up. But we would like to invite everybody out there that's watching this program to come on down and try to make a little bit of a difference. Let the people know where you stand. On what issue particularly? Where the issue is uh, medical marijuana. Okay, uh, and I might add there is another event upcoming. It's a little further away. Ken Burns, the great documentary filmmaker, has a new three-part show on Prohibition that will be airing on PBS. The first of the three installments is on October 2nd, so it's still a long time off, but uh, mark it on your calendar. Uh, it's a great place to learn something, and you'll be shocked when you see the parallels between alcohol prohibition and current drug prohibition. Uh, it's time for our standard plea, write your representatives, all of them. Senators, congressmen, State senators, state representatives, congressmen, U.S. senators, presidents, mayors, county judges. Justice of peace. Yeah. And write them, if you can, letters with stamps on them, and handwritten is better than even typed. But if you can't do that, send them an email, get on the Twitter, <laughs> uh, better yet call and set up an appointment to go see them when they're visiting your hometown in their local office. But they're your employees. They won't know what to do unless you tell them. And you should be nice about it, but one thing you need to remind them of is that just like you've hired them, in two years you can damn sure fire them. Now, <laughs> having set him up as my target, <laughs> I'll let our guest tonight uh, get his last word in here to tell us what he wants you to hear. Well, getting back to what he was just playing about, 
getting involved. And I was mentioning before the start of the show, one of my favorite quotes is by Ralph Nader. If you don't get into politics, politics will turn on to you. You got to get involved, whether it's writing, going down, setting the appointments, picketing, protesting, let them know what your voice is. You got too many people who just want to go on and complain to their friends and their coworkers. That's good at talk, but it's not enough action. To make actual change, we got to move it, whether it's for legalization of marijuana, which I know Clay is really for with medical marijuana. I mean, a lot of push for anything. Whatever you want to push, get involved. And I'm actually going to, one thing I really want to push for is for legalization of marijuana, increasization of uh, industrialized hemp inside of America, uh, uh, sorry, America, the, uh, actually getting us out of Iraq and Afghanistan. And Clay was asking me earlier about the 6% increase rate of congressman. I know it probably would never get passed, but one thing I would love to introduce is actually increasing, a, well, causing a decrease in their pal uh, salary. Uh, is it $178,000 uh, $178, they make a year? Uh, I believe the Constitution prohibits a decrease in salary <laughs> during their term. So if you voted in Congress to decrease the salary, we it would not be effective until the next congressional term. That's fine, but at least it'll be a push. you know. Yeah. And like I said, I joke around, I don't think it'll ever get passed, but who knows? Maybe it will. Get involved, let your senators, your congressmen know, because there is a difference between House of Representatives and Senators. Everyone's, hopefully, I hope y'all know that. But get involved, write, and yell. Another thing is actually trying to change Americans' foreign policy. You're seeing a lot of change in Latin America, which I'm proud of. I mean, you see a lot of people demonizing Hugo Chavez. <coughs> I'm proud of the man. A lot of people call him a dictator, a socialist, crazy nut. He's doing a lot for his people. He decreased poverty by 50% in his nation, 70% of extreme poverty. He pushed out a lot of this privatization, uh, privatization of uh, their natural resources. You saw in Bolivia, Ecuador, mass protests when American industries were trying to take control of their water rights. I mean, for God's sakes, they're trying to say you can't even collect rainwater. I mean, saying something that's falling from the sky, you can't contain in a bucket. That's ridiculous. And I mean, you saw Bechtel with this totally turned face in what they were doing. It was almost 25% of a person's salary just to pay their water bill. And you're seeing that all throughout, like change throughout uh, Latin America. And you're seeing a lot of change in, in the Middle East, too. You're seeing a lot of mass protests from Egypt, Syria, Libya. Lebanon, a lot of areas are protested up in arms in a lot of countries that, you know, were backed by America. You had just a big push of them. This blowback's coming at us. Yeah. And if we don't change form now, you're going to see a lot of countries turning face on us. And we're going to pretty much be alone in the world with maybe two, three allies. And yeah. let's face it, numbers is what a lot of other countries look at. You know, one of the problems is that oftentimes we look for what keeps stability in the world. Stable means doing things the way it was done before, and I'm not sure that keeping stable, well, stable is what you want right if now. you've got Assad or Saddam Hussein or Mubarak. Well, we the thing them about power. letting the people have their say, the thing about going with the democracy, the beautiful thing about it is it's so unpredictable because if there's one thing the people don't want is to just keep doing the same old same old time oh. after time so yeah if we get rid of Assad in Syria it's going to be less stable but it may be more democratic and there's more chance for improvement oh so. yeah and it'll, it'll open up a lot of opportunities, man. If we actually show the people we're backing them, yeah. maybe you see a lot of this hatred towards America start shifting. As, as I was talking about earlier, this is a lot of this blowback. I mean, we yeah. brought Saddam into power. Yeah. It, it's no joke. You know, this and is not a conspiracy. And financed his 10 year war with yes. Iran. Yeah. I mean, in, I was talking about this earlier in the 80s. Yeah. You had Reagan funding the Contras war in Nicaragua. Mm -hmm. I mean, what is going on that through arms dealers in Iran, a known menace of America? Yeah. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's a joke, pretty much. And this is one thing I would like to see a change in. And, uh, uh, yeah, to say something about Clayton and his gathering the people this Friday, uh, you've mentioned it. Uh, 
I was noticing on TV this week or so uh, a lot of talk about uh, the new Martin Luther King monument in Washington. I recall in the mid-60s a mammoth, mammoth, mammoth demonstration in Washington uh, where King gave his I Have a Dream speech with literally hundreds of thousands of people there. I remember just a few years later a massive demonstration in Washington and moving from the mall to the Pentagon with hundreds of thousands of people and many of us can still visualize very easily teenage girls putting flowers in the soldiers. Mm -hmm. guns. Guns, yes. The people can speak and if the people speak loudly enough, in the 1930s, Woody Guthrie, the great American singer, had a song about soup from soup kitchens. And he said that that soup was so thin that even a congressman could see through it. And if you make the protest visible enough, even a congressman, and dare I say it, even a governor can get the message. It's your country. What do you want to do with it? That's right. Exactly. Anything else, either of you guys? We no. got about a minute and a half, so okay. sell hard if you've got to sell. No, it, it's just that um, I do believe that it's time that people start really getting down uh, with the drug war because I believe the drug war will create yeah. jobs as well as cr uh, growing hemp will create jobs. I just said it will save the the economy, the budget, a lot of money. I mean, how much was it for Operation Pipe Dreams? Twelve million dollars? Well, I don't know. And they know, just got one guy to spend six months? The, the general estimate that's going around is that the 40 years of the war on drugs since Nixon has cost about one trillion dollars. That's half as much as Congress was able to come up with in savings this past month. I believe so. in the 70s it was almost estimated around five billion so just if for we a couple could save years. another trillion by stopping the war on drugs we might be in a whole lot better shape. Well we stopped the war on drugs we also ease this you know back into the cartels pretty yeah. much they lose their industry. If you take that 30 billion dollars a year away from them they can't afford to fight, and they have nothing left to fight over. And you won't and see American corruption like the ATF allowing arms to yeah. them. <laughs> and the clock is running down. Uh, we hope we've given you something to think about. And, and we hopefully see we'll see you Friday at 8 a.m., 1201 Franklin Street. Yeah. We'll have uh, posters. We'll have pamphlets that will be passed out to people coming in and out of the courthouses. So the more of you can get down there, the more impression that we are going to leave on our community leaders. We have these private prisons that have now hired lobbyists to go get minimum mandatory uh, I began to understand that, that 17 or the 19 year old kid I had in the backseat of my police car was not a criminal at all. Remove the profit motive. If you remove the profit motive, you can do away with almost all these problems. And how do you do that? Simple. You end the prohibition, which can only mean one thing legalize drugs. Legalize all drugs. If we really want to improve our urban neighborhoods, the most important thing that we could do, the single most important thing that we could do,